Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, um, I've just been thinking, uh, as Mike said, uh, the Lord has dealt bountifully with us, and I just, uh, the reality of that, it's just it's stirring in my heart the goodness of God and how good he has been to us. And uh, that day, seems that day, on that day, we will be exalted. Jesus will be exalted, and he will exalt us. He exalts us. He, so these words, his words, come, enter in, this word. Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the, from the foundation of the world. That is the, Jesus saying what he will say to us. And it has so encouraged my heart that that day, like tomorrow is Monday, that day is on the calendar in heaven. That day is a day that we look forward to. And my heart is full of hope and we eagerly await that day. And I'm just saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, we do fix our eyes on the bigger story. We get our eyes off the smaller story and onto the bigger story, your story, Lord, and this end that we look forward to of your kingdom, our inheritance, the joy, the abundance, the bounty. Lord, we fix our eyes on that and let it be an anchor in our hearts of hope. We worship you, Lord, as we await and eagerly expect that day and pray in all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can grab a seat. So with that, Mark, would you come on up? We're excited to have Mark with us this morning as he's going to come teach. Oh, and uh, That was kind of weak. Like, come on. Like, that was... <laughs> Is that better? No, that's a little, that that's a little worse. Huh? <laughs> hey, would you extend our hand? We want to pray for him this morning. Yeah, take it. Yeah, I need prayer. Lord, uh, Mark needs prayer. Yes. Uh, no, Lord, God. we just thank you, man. He is such a blessing to our body and to our church, and uh, he's an incredible friend. And uh, Lord, most of all, he's your friend. You called him a friend. So Lord, we just, uh, we embrace him today. We just love him. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak through him. And we just ask that he would be encouraged as he preaches your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks, Danny. Um, Church, it is good to be here worshiping with you under this big tent. Kathleen and I, I thought Kathleen and I were going to be here together. Uh, Kathleen, are you here somewhere? All right. All right. So I didn't leave her in Tulare. Um, but we have been uh, serving our church in Tulare uh, most of this year, um, 2021. And uh, so we haven't been able to get back here a lot. But we're excited to be here worshiping with you today and enjoying what God's doing among us. And he is good. You know, what's been read, the scriptures have been shared. David, thank you for sharing. Mike, uh, God is beautiful and he is good toward us. And, you know, earlier it was interesting when I was walking around, I was chatting with a few folks and God was speaking to my heart. This has nothing to do with the teaching. So 20 minutes, huh, Mike? Uh, he was speaking to my heart and I, I felt like there was a word that he had for us together today. And what I saw is I saw a picture of a pathway like going through a wooded area that's like an adventurous looking place, but maybe a place we haven't been before. And there was people walking on that pathway and they were kind of looking around like, where do we go next? What's happening? And the simple phrase that I heard from God was that I see you. I see you. I'm with you. And just felt like that was meant to be a word of comfort for those of us here individually, maybe going through things or maybe as families where there feels like we're in the middle of like not quite sure where we're at and where we're going, maybe searching a bit, maybe feeling like we're on a pathway, but we're not sure where that pathway ends up, you know? And God is saying, I see you right where you're at, and I'm with you. And I know I'm super grateful that God comes to us as a father that says, I'm not just with you and for you when you do it my way. I'm with you and for you all the time. And I'm looking to lead you. I'm wanting to make my way known to you. So pray that that would be an encouragement. Hey, grab your Bibles. We've been in a really helpful series uh, for the last about nine weeks that's called Assemble. And some of you have been here for that. Most of you have been here for most of that. But this series 
has been exploring biblical metaphors about what the church is. So different pictures that God has given us in his word about what the church is. And I personally think it's perfect timing for this, for a series on the identity of the church, because I think most of you would agree with me that 2020 was a pretty weird, disorienting, confusing year. And I know a lot of people went through a bit of an identity crisis, like they're not working at their jobs, they're in their homes and their sweatpants. And they're, as students, they're not in schools, they're looking at computer screens. And it was a weird year. And as we're still kind of navigating coming through that, I think that identity crisis happened a little bit for the church. You know, do you, do you also feel that? Because like a lot of the things that we used to do as a church in 2020 got shifted up partway through the year and they stopped like Sunday services, meeting in a building, having any kind of meetings at all in person. You know, we started hearing things publicly said like stay apart and stay healthy. You know, that was the big deal. Stay apart and stay healthy. And that doesn't jive really well with, with my understanding of life at all. It was probably the right thing to say regarding COVID, but it's not the right thing to say regarding most of life. And so I think that the church also went through a bit of an identity crisis in this last year. And I think we're still coming out of that. We're coming out of that identity crisis and saying, who are we? What are we? What is the church? Is it Sunday morning services or meetings? Is it meeting in a building? Because if it's meeting in a building, guess what? Here at Radio, we haven't done it for like since March. So it's not meeting in a building. What is the church? What is God's plan for the church? What is his goal for the church? So I think this series has been super helpful for us. And we've looked at quite a few metaphors already through this series that have really been pretty neat. We've talked about the church being the bride of Christ We've talked about the body of Christ. We've talked about the flock. We've talked about the church being the family of God. Well, this morning, or actually last week, Mike kicked us off with the last mat metaphor that we're going to look at, and that's the church as a building. And it's like, when I read that, it's like, like flock, family, body, bride. Those sound so kind of cool and warm and fuzzy and really organic and alive, and then it's the church as a building. You know, it feels kind of stiff, doesn't feel very alive, feels a lot more rigid, but I want to encourage you, don't lean out right now, but lean in. Lean in. There's, there's about 40% of us that they, according to terminology, we are called left brain dominant. Are you familiar with what that means, some of you? Is nobody familiar with what that means? All right. So left brain dominant versus right brain dominant. We both have left and right sides, guys. But uh, the right brain dominant people are those that just love everything organic and artistic and creative. And the left brain dominant tend to be people that kind of enjoy structure and a plan and strategy. They kind of like that. Like they like to live their life that way. I, I happen to be a left brain dominant kind of person. Some of you out there left brain dominant? Some of you are afraid to acknowledge it, but it's true. Um, well, I want to encourage you, this particular metaphor of the church is something that should make the left brain dominant people smile a little bit. Because it has to do with things like structure and plan and strategy. And I want to tell you, as we jump into this teaching, this is not just about the church. This is about who God is. Do you know that God happens to be left brain? I'm not going to say dominant, but he's left brain and he's right brain fully. He's, he's all of that. Fully creative, artistic, he created this entire universe. Read Genesis. He looked out and said, you know what? I have some ideas. I have some thoughts. And he spoke a word and created it, but he's also very strategic. He planned all of this out. This didn't happen through just some kind of accidental thing. God spoke it into being. Every single chromosome, every bit of how creation fits together and works was planned by our God. 
He's strategic. He's full of structure. So don't lean out. I encourage you to lean in for this teaching. And I also want to give a little bit of a disclaimer right up front as we talk about the church as the building of God. I want to remind you so that we don't take a wrong turn here. This is a metaphor. This is a metaphor. This is not about a literal building. I know that during uh, 2020, when we weren't meeting in buildings, there was quite a bit of uproar around the world about like, we've got to claim our buildings back. Uh, and I, I don't want to make statements about that either way, other than to say this teaching, when we talk about the church as the building of God, we're not talking about a physical structure because as we read the Bible, as we read the New Testament, it seems clear to us that Jesus didn't come to establish a church that was somehow connected to a physical building. That's not what Jesus came to establish. It's all right, we have a really cool physical building and we're gonna be back in that building someday, maybe very soon, we're gonna be back in that building. But that's not what Jesus came to establish. He came to establish a church that is built into a building that is comprised of people. The church is the people of God. Being, it, being built into a building. I just want to say that as a disclaimer right up front, because I don't want you taking the turn to thinking this is something literal about the building. Now, we know that on these other metaphors, when we talk about the bride of Christ, nobody's thinking, okay, this is literal. I've got to go get a bridal gown, and that's how I'm going to be the church. We're not thinking when we talk about the flock that it's something literal. So I just want to remind you, let's glean from this metaphor, what is God wanting to say to us? about being built together into his building. Amen? You guys with me? Okay, let's look at a couple key scriptures. First one is in Ephesians chapter two. All right, I'm gonna read quite a bit of it. It's not all gonna be up on your screen, but you can turn there and read yourself. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is being built and joined together and rises to become a temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Thank you, God. God makes it really clear in this passage in Ephesians 2, it says quite a few things about being built into the building of God. I, I like how uh, the last verse of this reads in the message. It says, now he's building you up brick by brick and stone by stone into a building with Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. Brick by brick, stone by stone. It's fun thinking of that. If we're in that building, we'd be looking at those bricks, thinking brick by brick. Every person has a place in this. This passage in Ephesians 2 says very clearly that there's a cornerstone to this building. Who's the cornerstone? Who's that cornerstone? Jesus. He's the cornerstone to the building, which means the whole thing rests on that piece being in place. And then he says there's some foundational parts. Now, this is not a trick question, but I want you to think about this. So what is the foundation to be? Yeah, you're going like, okay, this is a trick question. Because <laughs> I want to make clear with you, and I think Mike talked about this some last week. It talks about the foundation of the, of the apostles and prophets. The foundation is not the apostles and prophets. It's not them as people. It's the teaching of the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. The apostles and prophets were sent into every church at the beginnings of it to lay the foundation. The foundation was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. That is the foundation for the church. Everything else is meant to be built on the foundation of the gospel of grace with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So in this building, amen, in this building, the foundation is very clear. And then it says, we're all being fit together in this building. We're being fit into place. I love that Ephesians 2 also says why. Why are we being made into a building for God? It says, in, to, in, in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Do you know what the reason that God is building us together into being a building for his sake in this world 
is that his glory and his presence would be shown to this world around us. That's why. It's so that God's glory and presence could be seen. He's building us into a building. The other passage I want you to turn to is in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 4 and 5 and then 9 and 10. It says, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, the one that was rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a building, to be a holy priesthood. Down to verse 9, it says, you are a chosen people. You've been hand-selected by God. You know that? You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are living stones being built upon the living stone, Jesus Christ. And again, the purpose of this house is that the beauty of God would be declared, that his praise would be declared, that his fame would be known in this world around us. That's why. Now, I want to just make a comment here that as we talk about this building, being built into a building, and there's terminology used in both of these passages, like a temple. I want to remind you that the first disciples that were hearing this about the New Testament church, their mindset would have immediately turned back to what they were coming out of. They were coming out of this understanding of the temple as the place where God dwelt that was in the middle of the city. It was a place that they went and we can see a little bit of this transition, this shift that God is leading his church to. Because in the Old Testament, the way it was, there was a temple that was built. The first one was Solomon's temple. And if you read uh, back in, in the Old Testament, you can find the very specific passages that detail Solomon's temple being built. First Kings 6 and 7 talks about it, but it's very ornate. It's very elaborate. It's very specific like a lot of things out of gold. It details every little thing, every curtain, everything in its place. And that temple was massive and it was amazing. And everyone that saw it at that time was amazed by it. They were overwhelmed. Well, guess what? That temple didn't last all that long because about 500 years after that temple was built, this magnificent temple, it was destroyed by the Babylonians because God's people just continued to struggle with rebellion. How many of you know that we struggle with rebellion, like doing things our way? That's that simple. We do things our way. And so for God to get his people back, get their attention back, he allowed some of their rebellion to have its effect on their lives. And the temple was destroyed, and about 400 years later, Children of Israel are going back to rebuild the temple. You can read it in Ezra and Nehemiah. They're going back to rebuild this temple and rebuild the walls, and they start kind of setting the foundation. And people that knew about the Temple of Solomon, it says they looked at it and they were really sad because this, this new temple they were building didn't compare to the temple that was there before. And so God says something very specific to them. He begins this shift. See, God's trying to shift them out of thinking that, the, that God's presence lived in a physical building. So God says to them in Haggai 2, he says, hey, don't worry. The glory of this latter temple, this later temple coming, is going to be way better than the glory of the first temple. Way better. He says the glory of it. The building wasn't way better. The second temple that came was way, it wasn't near as beautiful as the first temple, but God was trying to shift his people's attention. He said, the glory of what's coming is way better than what you had. Then Jesus in John chapter two comes and he says, if you tear down this temple and he was standing in Jerusalem, he says, if you tear down this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And all the Jews looking around, the Pharisees were saying like, what? This took like 40 years to build. What does he mean? What was Jesus talking about? When he said, if you tear down this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. What was he talking about? Himself. He was, he was, he was taking the next part of that shift saying, it's not a physical building. 
I'm the temple. I'm the temple. And then there's a further shift that comes as we read in the New Testament. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and it says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we, these passages we've just read, we are being built into the temple of God, the building of God. It's us. It's you as an individual follower of Christ and me as followers of Jesus and us being built together into something that demonstrates his glory and his beauty and his presence in our world. There's not a need for the physical temple anymore. It's all right for us to have a building for us to meet in, for us to gather in. But you know what? The real temple that God's talking about here is the temple of his church, being a people that carry his presence into the world. This metaphor of the church as the building of God brings attention to a few things that um, are worth noting, I think, for us. There's three of them here that I want us to look at. The first thing is, is that it's strategic and it's systematic. God's plan for the church is strategic and systematic. Now, if God was going to come to us and say, you know, I want to build the church and it's going to be a sandcastle, all he would do is give us a bucket, say, sit down in the sand, and you just start building something. Because a sandcastle is not expected to last that long, and so it doesn't have to be that strategic. But God doesn't compare the church to a sandcastle. He says it's a building. And there's builders in this place here today. What do you need for a building? You need plans. You need architects that design it. You need engineers that make sure that the building, if you build it the way you're planning, is going to stand. Because if you don't engineer it properly, if you don't plan it properly, you can spend all the time you want building a pretty building, and what will it do? It'll fall down. So, first thing this says about the church is that it's strategic, it's systematic. God is the architect. He's the designer. He has plans for your life that are very specific and strategic, and he has plans for the church, for our church, that are very specific, very strategic, very systematic. The second thing this says about the church is that it's structured. There are certain pieces that fit certain ways. God has already identified his chosen foundation, the gospel of Christ. The gospel of grace is the foundation. We don't have to be wondering, I wonder what the foundation should be. It's clear. It's the gospel of grace. It's clear who this whole thing should be built around. It's not the pastor in the church. It's Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. That's who this all is to revolve around and be built around. Some other structural things that are real clear in the scriptures is there's biblical values to what the church is to look like. Now, God gives us quite a bit of freedom in how we build the church in some of the smaller things, like what kind of building we're going to be in. That's fine. What, kind of, what type of music are we going to sing? You know, what's going to be how we dress. Are we going to dress in three-piece suits? Are we going to, sorry, dress in shirts that might have limes and salt shakers on them? Probably not right. Shorts. You know what? You know, we can choose. We can choose some of those things. But there are certain things we're not supposed to choose. We're not supposed to choose if this is a place of grace or not. Guess what? The church is to be a place of grace. We're not supposed to be able to choose if this is a place of forgiveness and mercy and love because God has already chosen his, in his word the biblical values for his church. They're structural. He says, build this way with mercy, with forgiveness, with love, with compassion. Really clear. It's structural. He's also given leaders to help in that structural process elders and deacons and people that lead, pastors that lead. They are not the foundation, but they're structural elements. They're part of how God designed his church to be built together. The third thing that I see, and they're all S's, I had to stretch a little bit because I wanted the third thing to be symbiotic stones. And I thought, oh man, I like people that are biology teachers are going to look at me and say, you're really doing this. But 
God also built his church, not with just strategy and system and with structure, but with stones, with living stones, living stones that are placed by God into the design of how he made it. So what that says to you and I, it says you fit. Do you know that? I don't care how young you are or how old you are. I don't care how long you've walked with God, if it's one day or if it's 75 years. I want to say to you, you fit in the building of God. In his plan, and his design for the church, you fit. It also says something else. It says you're not foundational. Neither am I. We're not foundational. We're not the requirements here. But you matter. For the building that God has designed for the church to show his glory to this world, to this city, to this valley, guess what? You fit and you matter. What God wants to do, you fit into this process. So what's the takeaway for this? I think the takeaway, first of all, is this is a, a real invitation for us to surrender wholeheartedly to God's leadership in ways. And yes, this is about the church. So definitely let's, let's as a church, surrender wholeheartedly to his ways and his plans. But you know what? This is also to us as individuals. It's an invitation for wholehearted surrender to God. God has a way to lead your life. God has a way to lead your family, your marriage. He has a way to lead you as an employee at work or as a boss or as a student or as a teacher. He has a way. And my encouragement would be to surrender wholeheartedly to his way. Do it his way. Secondly, I think it's an invitation to fully engage and give ourselves. Oh, skipped one. It's an invitation to live in cooperation and submission to his structures. Now, I want to say there's a real difference between submission and surrender. All right. And I want to just touch this for a moment. When we talk about surrendering to God, that means we just say, God, it's your way. We open our hands and we say, God, we are going to do it your way. We don't want to do it our way. Submission is a different thing. When I talk about living in cooperation and submission to the structural elements like leadership and biblical values, the word submission in the Greek is actually a military term. And it's a military term that, that says basically to the soldiers, stay in step with those around you. And if you can imagine a group of soldiers walking together in cadence, the word submission means stay in step. Stay in step with those around you. And so the second invitation, first one, surrender to God, but then it's live in step with each other, in the church, with leaders. Are there other ways that the leaders can do it? Yes, there are other ways. But the invitation that God is giving us is, hey, stay in step with the leaders that I've given. Try to stay in step with them so that my building would be erected and bring attention. And I think the third thing is an invitation for us to fully engage and give ourselves to his work. You know, the church is not meant to be something where we sit and look at screens a whole lot where we just watch. The church, the building that God is bringing is a building that is to house his presence and his glory and his goodness and his spirit for the world to see. So it's an invitation to give yourselves fully, to be engaged in this work, to be that brick, that stone that is being built together with other living stones that God would fill his church with his presence. That's the goal. It's that God's glory would be seen, that God's presence would be trumpeted in Visalia, in Tulare, in this valley, in our world, that the glory, the goodness, the love, the mercy, the grace of God would be championed by his church. Worship team, would you come? Mike or Danny? Thank you, Mark. You know, as we, uh, as we close our time together, I, really quick, I just want to invite parents to go get your children if they're in uh, with Radiant Kids and bring them back as we close in worship. But um, Mark, I, I was just impressed in my own heart, just my challenge to displace the presence of God to a meeting 
or to a place, but the, the real call is for us to realize that the presence of God is in us and it goes with us everywhere we go, to our, our workplace, to our families, to schools, to all those places we go each and every day and, and we, when we rub life with other people. And uh, I just want to invite you as we, uh, as we worship together, just submit your life to, to be filled with the Spirit and just invite that, that revelation to, to stick hold of your heart and your life, that, that we are the temple of God and where we go, the presence of God goes with us. So would you stand this morning and, and engage in that truth? Thank you.